Okay, hello everybody. Can you all hear me? So wave at you. Excellent. Okay, so good afternoon and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the remembering of the evacuation of St Kilda event. Um, I'm Julie Hunt, I'm the chairman of the St Kilda Club. Um, my colleague Emma will be putting links in the chat box of things that may be of interest as the event goes through. Um, first things first, this is the first time we've done an online event like this, so please bear with us from a technical point of view. We're going to make it as smooth as possible, but there may be some glitches, so just bear with us if you can. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who've never heard of the St Kilda Club, um, we've been running in one form or another since, since 1957, when the first work parties went out of St Kilda, um, and, and basically they camped on the island. Much has changed since those days, um, but we're still very, very passionate about the islands. And our aim is to raise awareness of St Kilda, of its outstanding beauty, animals, plant life, artifacts, archaeology, its buildings, culture, and today, most definitely the history of the island. As you may or may not know, the National Trust for Scotland's facilities on St Kilda have been closed all this season, which because of COVID-19, which has meant that the St Kilda Club, which runs a shop on the island, has not been open. Um, we've, um, the shop helps us to fund a variety of projects through the National Trust for Scotland, the conservation work of the island. Um, we've organised today's event alongside with the National Trust for Scotland to remember the evacuation of St Kilda, which is the 90th um, anniversary of today, which I'm sure you've seen lots of things in the media already today. Um, we have a combination of live speakers, along with interviews of families of people who have evacuated, um, some commemorative music later on, and also Radio 4 have kindly given us permission to replay, replay one of their programmes as well, which is we can only do on this day. We are recording today's um, event, so we're hoping that um, subject to it all going well, we'll be able to put it online and send you all a link afterwards. So if you miss a part, then you can obviously watch again later on. If I could just ask before we go any further, that if you could all try and make sure that you've kept muted throughout the day or throughout the event, just really for the enjoyment of everybody else here as well. So um, without much further ado, that's enough for me. I'm gonna hand you over to Craig Stanford, um, for those of you who don't know Craig, Craig is the, um, he was the um, archaeologist on St Kilda for the past three years. His claim to fame is that he spent over 450 days on the I'm island. Uh, so they send me an email, so that might be better. Which I'm sure it was, which is impressive for lots of us. Um, and he's now works in the archaeology and world heritage team at Historical, Historical, no, Historic Environment Scotland. So hopefully, Craig, you can now join us. Hello, hello. Hi, can well, you hear me? Hey. Fantastic, we can hear you, Craig. Excellent. I'm just going to attempt to share my screen and you let me know if it's working or not. I will do. Um, that'll be it, I think. That's perfect, Craig. That's lovely. I'll hey. meet myself and give you the table in a moment. Excellent, and we're off. So yes, hello, hi, hi from Sunny Leith. Um, yeah, indeed, I'm Craig. I'm, uh, as Julia said, was a St Kilda archaeologist from 2017 to 2019. Um, so I did, that's three seasons, uh, summer seasons, as well as the work in the winter. Um, and I, judging from the crazed tally marks, uh, scrawled into the manse walls, um, that was, was 450 days, almost on the nose. So yeah, just missing a couple hours. So the role of a St Kilda archaeologist is primarily focused on monitoring and overseeing the sensitive conservation of the physical cultural heritage of the, of the archipelago. Unlike, um, I think, a common perception of archaeologists most people seem to, to have when they arrive, when they speak to me, um, most of my work is in excavation. You know, uh, the, it's quite difficult to carry out something like an excavation within such a protected landscape. Uh, so there weren't very many opportunities for that. So more often than not, I was examining the historic structures for signs of decay, conserving or repairing that damage, uh, and updating the archaeological record to reflect the ancients. Okay. Uh, so the place is absolutely covered in archaeology. Evidence of the human past is never more than a stone's throw away. Although I'm sure if you've ever been on an NTS work party with myself, you'll know that I'm the last person to advocate for throwing a stones on an archaeological site. So, hmm, can't seem to, there we go. Um, hi, I'm, I'm extremely lucky to have spent so much time with St. Kilda, both the place and the concept. I've seen stunningly beautiful summer days and awe-inspiring February storms. I've spent many hundreds of hours chatting with visitors and colleagues about their perception of the place. 
that perception without a doubt is dominated by the event that we're remembering today. It's the centerpiece of a cultural phenomena, which we're all a part of. Uh, the, the events leading up to August 29th, 1930 have become legendary, even as they were happening. And the years since, uh, the, the, the story has been transformed into something akin to a classical Greek tragedy, with the inevitable fall of man being the final and seemingly, an, uh, you know, uh, just inevitable, uh, the uh, act and, and the tragic story of St. Gilda. Yet in context, the evacuation of the islands were, were not an uncommon event. A great many island communities in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries chose to leave their homes in the face of changing, changing circumstances. And so with uh, less than half an hour, I think I've got left now, um, it's my ambition, I hope not over ambition, to give you a little bit of context to the evacuation of St. Kilda. So the archipelago itself, I think, needs very little introduction. As early as 1527, it was described as the last and outmost isle of Scotland, a place which uh, can only be reached through extreme danger to life. Right from the start, when it enters the historical records, St. Kilda is defined by an overwhelming focus on its remoteness. We all capitalize on this remoteness. Certainly, I still do if I'm telling island tales down in the pub. Um, it's very far away from the large economic and cultural population centers of our modern society. Um, it's far away from where most of us make our home, you know, where, where we know the street names, where we know the landmarks, where we go drinking with friends while we celebrate holidays, you know, our homes. It's even if you live in the Hebrides, and you might be able to see St. Kilda uh, off on the horizon, but it's quite a difficult place to get to, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Um, it's quite a journey. So, and uh, I think it's, it's very rare for a lot of folk to make it out there. Um, so, uh, even the modern community of folk who work on island and spend large parts of the year there, NTS staff and volunteers, the good folk on the Soy Sheep Project, um, people working on the MOD base, I don't think any of them really call Extended. it home. No, 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 I haven't done anything yet. If we could just all make sure that the microphones are silenced, please. Thank you. Um, so even in, uh, I, yeah, it's been a long time since anyone really has called it home. Uh, but for those who did, I really do wonder if they would have considered themselves as remote. If it's the center of their world, maybe we are the remote ones, you know, just a bit of thought. So, uh, so yeah, despite this vision of remoteness shrouded in the mists, the archeology span of St. Kilda shows that it's actually very well connected. The big picture shows that all the trends happening across the Hebrides impacted St. Kilda as well. So the archeological record on St. Kilda is far from comprehensive. Thousands of years of human story on island, but we only see rare flashes of light in the darkness just because the evidence available is so limited. The earliest signs of human activity on St. Kilda are in the form and, and composition of these four small shards of Hebridean style Neolithic pottery. Uh, they date to about around five to six thousand then. years ago, so they are quite yeah. old. I'll leave you with that then. Yeah. If you uh -huh. need anything, place you. Are you in your buzzer? Skip Wait, forward right. a thousand years or so. Right. But they'll be right. recording it anyway. So I'll just bring it to your right under my feet. Can you see the word mm -hmm. move all? And can you can you do that? Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> Screen to the right, you say. Yeah, it should under participants. There should be a thing that says mute all. Oh, I see mute. I can mute. Mute myself. Uh, maybe mute, up here. It should be a mute all button. All right, there we go. Fabulous. Thanks. Sorry about that. That's okay. That was a very good tip. Thank you, Julie. Ah, uh, right. So, uh, I can't remember where I was. Oh yes, Neolithic pottery. Yeah. So, um, so we got this pottery. It's great. Uh, found in the nineties. Um, skip forward a thousand years or so, and we've got uh, these. We've got. A, a Bronze Age burial cairn right in the sort of lower reaches of the croft lands in Village Bay. Also got a series of stone tools which are built into the very walls which you can walk around um, throughout, all throughout the village. They're, they're everywhere actually and they're very easy to spot if you, if you have a good eye for it. Um, in the Iron Age we can be confident that we have the start of permanent habitation of Herta. Um, the famous House of the Fairies in Village Bay is an Iron Age souterrain typical in form to those built across Britain and Ireland over 2000 years ago. Early Christianity uh, arrived on St. Kilda at the same time and in the same sort of form as elsewhere in the Western Isles. Three carved stone crosses dating from the 8th to the 10th century AD can be seen in Village Bay if you know where to look. 
Same thing with the Vikings. All evidence points towards the same process as a Viking settlement happening on St. Kilda as elsewhere in the Hebrides. Names like Soe, Borre, Rioval, Oishaval, they bear the influence of the Norse language. And in the 19th century, an impressive Viking Age spearhead, a beautiful uh, pair of oval brooches were recovered from Village Bay, a classic signs of a Viking burial, I would think. From the medieval period onwards, the visible buildings and field systems all clearly belong to a wider tradition, which extends across much of Western Scotland. They grew crops and kept livestock, just like everywhere else, and even the practice of fowling, uh, hunting the seabirds for the meat, eggs, feathers, and oil was, was once fairly widespread across Atlantic Europe. Although it, by 1930, I think it was somewhat more rare. Uh, the archeology span shows evidence for the development uh, from a very typical Highland clacken. Ooh, I wonder where all those are coming from. Um, I don't know where this, I don't know what happened with those red lines. <laughs> uh, so get the typical development from the clacken uh, to the a typical sort of a, a, an improved crafting landscape uh, showing the slow transition from a medieval feudal estate held by the MacLeod chiefs to a carefully managed 18th century and 19th century estate designed to increase profit. Despite the common myth of no St. Kilda never having been involved in conflict, two St. Kilda volunteered for the British army during the Seven Years' War. The community in Herta was caught up in the same smallpox pandemic which swept through the Hebrides in the 18th century. The, the number of survivors on island vary depending on the sources that you read, but uh, I think even a conservative count has only 19 adults and 23 children surviving from a population of 130. A number of families from elsewhere in the McLeod estate on, on Skye and on Harris were given the opportunity to resettle on St. Kilda uh, to live alongside the survivors and to boost the population. There's no record of any issues between the incomers and natives, probably because there are so, they were so similar to begin with. Uh, sharing a common language and culture, the local traditions and skills on St. Kilda would have been easily adopted. The, there is one sad aspect of Scottish history that St. Kilda, Kilda does not share with other rural communities. There were no clearances or forced evictions on the island. There were plenty of push and pull factors and of course people left frequently uh, and would arrive. Um, but when the St. Kildans did choose to leave their home, they, it was through their own choice. So despite this remoteness, um, St. Kilda fits into the big picture of Hebridean and Highland history fairly well. The difficulties of its remoteness were apparently overcome frequently enough that in many ways St. Kilda is just a typical Hebridean island. Yet this archipelago, like rugged flint to steel, sparked a fascination which spread fast and is still reaching corners of the world today. Uh, modern tourism got its start as early as the 18th century. Martin Martin, visiting in 1697, so just before, uh, published his account of his voyage shortly after his visit, 1698. It's worth noting that Martin Martin himself was Gal a Gaelic speaker from Sky, so his record is, I think, one of the most interesting ones that we have. Um, the book was a hit and inspired a slow trickle of aristocratic travelers to make the journey themselves. At first, it was small yachts sailing to Village Bay, carrying passengers such as the Reverend Kenneth McCauley, who gives us a detailed description of the St. Kildan's fa famous climbing prowess. Reading his account, it's clear that they are they're showing off for their visitors, singing merrily and laughing while dangling hundreds of meters over the sea. The good Reverend could barely stomach the sight, but it's clear that the St. Kildans enjoyed putting on a show for him. And it was a performance that would be repeated many, many times over the next 180 years, even as the importance of fouling declined. Visitors increased um, after the turn of the 19th century. The first steamship, the Glen Albin, arrived in 1834, causing much excitement amongst the islanders. By 1877, there was a regularly scheduled commercial vessel sailing to St. Kilda three to five times a year. This ship, the beautiful steamer, the Denara Castle, sailed from Glasgow carrying, I think, up to about 40 passengers a pop. Many of the St. Kildans shrewdly tapped into this opportunity. They sold souvenirs, cheese, brooches, and apparently even dogs. So, um, indeed, uh, tourism benefited them in a huge way. So before, contact with their neighbors would have been in the form of visits from the estate factors. Uh, you know, they would have carried out trade, often probably in an exchange rate, which would be very unfavorable for the St. Gildans. It's not a great relationship necessarily. And of course, they would have to pay their rent. 
Um, you would also get fishermen coming in from neighboring isles, uh, taking shelter in Village Bay, as still happens to this day. Um, and also, um, the St. Kildans would make journeys and voyages of their own. They, at different points in time in history, they did have small boats. I know there was definitely one occasion in the mid 18, in the mid 19th century, where um, one of the boats sailing to the Hebrides in order to exchange goods, um, unfortunately, was lost with all hands. So, you know, there are tragedies to contend with. Um, but now, now you've got people turning up to come and see them out of curiosity. And even better, they're really wealthy. So they've got an expendable income. So, and throughout the summers now, St. Kildans could expect uh, the opportunity to import foodstuffs, furniture, building materials, and export some of their own produce in return. However, there is a dark side to this tourism. These were Victorians after all. The idea of the noble savage was all the rage and many of the visitors to St. Kilda came to gawk at these obviously less evolved humans. Many of the modern myths about St. Kilda originate from this time, in particular, the fascination with their genetics and some kind of race of uncorrupted ancient humans living on some sort of prehistoric Jurassic Park, uh, totally cut off from the outside world. The accounts from this period are rife with this pressing need to judge the St. Kildans, often with grand moralistic platitudes. I think it must have been exhausting being a Victorian tourist because, you know, who else is going to maintain the constant vigilance against the moral decay of society? Must have been very tiring indeed. So ethics aside, um, the benefit of this extra income from tourism allowed the community to change in new ways. And the St. Kildans adapted quite handily to it. Strangely, the 19th century on the archipelago was generally pretty good for them, you know, particularly compared to other neighboring islands. There were tragedies, of course, and there were bad years for the harvests, but, you know, that was kind of the case everywhere, really. Uh, I mean, think about the Irish potato famine, or just rather potato famine, potato blight all across Britain and Ireland. Um, many accounts point towards the first large emigration from St. Kilda in 1852 is an example of how bad life must have been for them. But that year, uh, eight, eight families, 36 people, emigrated to Australia, traveling first to Liverpool and then boarding the bark to Priscilla. Unfortunately, most of them didn't make the crossing. Uh, I think it was measles, took quite a few of them out. Um, but interestingly, their stated reason for emigrating, to Saint, emigrating from St. Kilda was the fact that uh, it was, it was, their stated reason was for religious protest. You see, these events took place in the middle of something called the disruption, which was a schism between the established Church of Scotland and the Free Church of Scotland. All across Scotland, there were rising tensions between landlords who often owned the churches and the manses and preferred the established church, and tensions with the tenantry who, who were gripped by religious evil and also desired to be in control of their own religious affairs. It's not much to ask, I think, in some ways. So on the St. On St. Kilda, the landlord had gone as far as to lock the church doors, uh, and, and he barred entry to the island uh, for the minister, and the manse was locked up as well. So that's the minister that the St. Kildans themselves had chosen. It's... Yeah, I think in protest to this, that's, the, that's why the St. Kildans chose to leave in, in 1850. And the remaining islanders use that and leverage that, I think, very effectively. So it, really, you can kind of see this as like a rural tenant's form of industrial action. It's like a strike depriving the landlord of his income. And it's also highly political. You know, these religious changes are also paired with efforts to improve tenants' rights in response to the horrors of the clearances. So after the departure to Australia, yeah, the remaining islanders leveraged their position very effectively. Landlord unlocked the doors to the church and uh, moved the lease from the established church to the free church. So they actually won. For me, this story has a lot of value in the perception, the story of St. Kilda, you know, this concept of the place I mentioned earlier. In keeping with the, the Greek style the tragedy, the common narrative of the St. Kildans completely robs them of their agency and depicts them as doomed heroes struggling uh, to, against their fate, faced with the flaws of their own culture and lifestyle. At least that's my reading of a lot of the modern, even modern accounts. Um, there's this line from The Life and Death of St. Kilda. I think it's an absolute cracker. It goes, uh, the stern faith of the free church made slaves to the people of St. Kilda, of the people of St. Kilda. Religion in the hand of some was, was to stifle what little innovation uh, the St. Kildans had. So I think this quote shows a deep misunderstanding of the historical context and betrays quite a fatalistic agenda. 
A critical assessment of the community's actions and the national context in which they're happening shows that they really could fight for what they wanted to. They didn't need their best interests explained to them for, by an outsider, and they, they brushed aside this paternalistic guiding hand of the local elite. They made their own choice. So when you recognize that the St. Kildans have agency, meaning uh, they have the capacity as individuals or as a community to make their own free choices, then I think you begin to see the events leading up to the evacuation a little bit more clearly. So by the time we hit the Tweedy Victorian era, the Islanders had transformed themselves into a community of weavers, selling tweed both to tourists and exporting it to Glasgow. Actually, a young St. Kildan by the name of A.G. Ferguson had left St. Kilda in 19, 1892, moved to Glasgow and actually managed to build up quite an impressive business importing his fellow islanders tweed. He was very successful, a uh, beautiful, beautiful shop on Hope Street, which you can still see today, uh, just across from Glasgow Central, in fact. So eventually, uh, he, when, he, when he became successful, he would, he would sail out to the islands once a year in his own yacht in order to do business with them. This, uh, this was great for the islanders that kind of cut out the factor as a middleman uh, and opened up new economic opportunities for them. The First World War was actually great for the St. Kildans, kind of weird to say that, but it, yeah, I mean, the Admiralty stationed a small squad of radio men on island to report the movements of German U-boats, which brought more employment opportunities to the islanders, and it was the highest level of communication they'd ever had. There was a regular patrol boat coming out to deliver supplies to, to the squad there um, and uh, actually had the ability for direct radio contact with neighboring islands and the mainland. Unfortunately, these benefits were largely removed at the end of the war and things went back to the way they had been before 1914. This experience did, I think, the most to, to convince the St. Kildans that they, they could get a better life elsewhere. For the rest of the decade and the next, many young men and women chose to leave the island, uh, several families as well. They left their homes to settle in places like Lewis and Glasgow, Fife and the Black Isle. Um, at the end of the day, I think it just comes down to life was improving so rapidly elsewhere and it just wasn't quite keeping up on St Kilda. Access to better education, to more really, I think really importantly, access to very good healthcare um, and economic opportunities, you know, these are key things that you know, it just wasn't quite keeping up on island, despite other improvements. So I think it's unfair to say that they left because their way of life was failing. We'd seen 5,000 years of, well, you know, success. <laughs> you know, it wasn't without tragedy, wasn't without hardship, of course, but they had done it. Um, and also, I've never liked the idea that it was a modern life which just came in and destroyed their lifestyle and, you know, their community. I think we should give them their agency back. They made a positive economic decision about their own future. And I mean, how many of us have left where we grew up and moved to other places, for example, cities, you know, in order to study or gain better career prospects? I'm not trying to oversimplify the complex community of St. Kilda. Life there is very different from ours, but we are still humans at the end of the day and some things don't really change. So I think we all know the, the end of the story. Uh, the population had fallen to 36 islanders and the demographic bell curve was skewed far too heavily towards the elderly end of the spectrum. Tragedy struck uh, the community in the form of the death of two young women in fairly quick succession from you know, things that had been probably quite preventable if they'd been on the mainland. The discussions were had, the decision was taken and they petitioned the government to assist in their evacuation. There can be no doubt that this was sad, and it's always going to be sad, but, you know, it was a choice. And here we are, 90 years later, talking about a remote island that has so much in common with the Hebrides and rural highlands, inhabited by a people which, who have largely had, largely had their story told for them. I realize I have to recognize I'm one of those storytellers, uh, but it's a bit ironic. Um, but I think, I hope, if I've done one thing for this talk, it's that I'm encouraging everyone to be maybe a bit more critical about the way the narrative is so often told. Imagine it being you know, your life. Imagine your life being described in the sort of the way that we see the St. Kilden's lives described. I think we would all probably have something to say about it. There's always more context there. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Craig. Okay, I'm, I've, got, I've got some questions for you. So, um, 
Is it possible to say, so one of the questions come through from Maggie, is it possible to say how the first, tra first, the first inhabitants travelled to St Kilda, given how hazardous a journey can be? How? Um, yeah, I mean, it, just by boats, <laughs> you know, um, it would have been dangerous, would have been hazardous, would have been very, very scary, I imagine. But uh, you know, during the Neolithic period of Scotland, as, as early, so it's five to 6,000 years ago, you know, maybe even more, um, people had boats. You know, we don't, I think um, we don't fully understand what kind. We, we've, we found um, some form of Neolithic boats, uh, and I think Bronze Age boats are more common in, in places like the bottom of locks where they're being preserved. Um, and you know, they can be as simple as just a hollowed out tree trunk, kind of like a canoe. Um, but, but yeah, uh, certainly Neolithic people did. They went everywhere. They were explorers. Um, they, they really did uh, push the boundaries, I think, in a lot of ways and were successful. That's why we've had uh, occupation and habitation. I mean, on almost all of Scotland's islands, I mean, even as far up as uh, Sulis Gear and uh, Fula, it's, it's impressive. So yeah, they, they managed it somehow. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, so I've got a message, um, a question from it's either M Marie or Mari. Um, did a boat attack um, happen near the islands in World War One? Yes, it did. May 15th, 1918. Um, that was a U-boat. Uh, it's about 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, started firing on the uh, the target was the it wasn't the islanders. It wasn't the village. Uh, it was the radio stations. So they were aware of it. It'd been there for most of the war. And uh, we're in 1918. We're right up at the end of the war, the last year of the war there, and, and at least in Western Europe. So, um, yeah, they, they attempted to take out the radio mast, uh, blew up the feathers, that was commonly called the feather store, the taxman's house and store, the building that's right on the shore there, um, and damaged a couple of the houses. But nobody was killed, apart from, I think there was an account that says one lamb, one lamb was caught. I believe I've read the same account, yes. Yeah. Okay, and from Arena, would there have been any way of telling if there was a permanent Viking settlement or did they use it as a kind of filling station to replenish water, rest, etc? Yeah, there, were, there would be a way of telling, but it requires a lot of excavation. We probably have to dig up the modern village to do it. Um, yeah, it's uh, we don't know at the moment, so we couldn't say, and that's, uh, that is, I think, probably the case for quite a lot of St Kilda's history you know there's a very good chance it would have been um, a stopping point or you know like a, a summer hunting grounds for for, for, for the birds um, you know it, it could have taken a couple of different forms and the way we would prove that would be excavation but I would imagine with something like a burial on island that burials tend to be near settlements um, I suspect it will be in Village Bay and the best place for habitation Village Bay is right under the modern village so <laughs> Yeah, um, maybe someday uh, more work will be done and, and we can answer that more clearly. No, that's fine. And so, and Bill's asked, um, what was your most amazing find or discovery whilst on St Kilda? So I haven't actually done anything with this yet and I would like to, <laughs> I need to look into, uh, there was, it's, it's a little tiny shard of uh, bone china, so porcelain, and it's um, hand painted with an oriental scene. And I, I need to double check. Uh, I, I need to get my hands on a really good pottery catalog book to be sure. Um, but I do suspect it was actually made in, in Asia, which is amazing. And it's probably from the 1830s, 1840s. It's fairly early. You know, it's definitely not a later thing, uh, likely from something just like a teacup. And uh, yeah, I found, I found that while doing some work on a, on a cleat turf roof a couple of years ago. And um, it's amazing to think in the picture. So we, it's, 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 a, it's a woman in a full sort of, you know, kimono with an umbrella and you could see sort of cherry blossom trees just behind her. And it's only a small piece. Um, that's my favorite bit because again, just really showing how connected this place can be. And it's funny to think of a St. Kilda in the way that maybe a lot of people think of, you know, very wild, but you know, here they are with a very, very delicate, lovely teacup sitting in their cottage. That's my favorite bit. Definitely. Um, so John Edwards asks, how many of the 36 evacuees died soon after due to illness that they had no resistance to? John says he should know, but he doesn't. I should know and I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I haven't heard of that many people dying so quickly after that, after evacuation. Um, but I don't know either. I mean, I certainly know there was a handful of St. Kildans uh, lived for quite a long time. Obviously, you would be, you know, including the, the, the children. I mean, Rachel Johnson just died in 2016. Um, you know, so that was so only a few, a few, few years away from the last St. Kildan. Um, and quite a few of the St. Kildans continued to return to the islands after evacuation. I think that's something not many people realize that after 1930, it didn't come to a full stop. It actually became semi-inhabited for another 
another 10 years, you know, just seasonally rather, you know, so every summer a handful would come back and work for Lord Butte, the new owner of the islands, um, or they would come and basically just keep making tweed and sell them to tourists and engaging in that economy. So, yeah, but I don't know. Um, I would have to look that up. No, no, that's fine. And um, Sandra asks, do you know who's in the picture? I'm going to say below, but on the screen. At just the here. Yeah. Oh, Oh, see, I'm always, I always get, I'm really bad for the faces and the names. Um, you see them and you see them age. It's amazing. You can see them as children and then you see them grow up and you get used to their faces, but I'm terrible for connecting names. I know there'll be plenty of people in this chat who do know. Um, so maybe, maybe somebody can send, pop a message in there. Um, yeah. That is, I think it's, it's I want to say it's Finley McQueen, but um, oh, I'll, I'll probably get that wrong, to be honest. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. So Stephen Oliver would like to know, he said, great talk, Craig. Um, what role did the community nurse play in recommending or assisting the St Kildans in making their choice for evacuation? She did assist, and, and I believe that was her own personal um, belief that, that making an evacuation would be the best thing for the community. Um, but uh, certainly she did assist and she was appointed uh, after the community had already sent their request to the government. Um, the government appointed her as sort of the main organizer on the ground, kind of the ground officer for the whole operation. Um, we had a full detail of the record of the discussion that was had in the factor's house in her, in her accommodation. Um, you know, the discussion surrounding the evacuation. Um, I know there are various accounts that give you, you know, a bit of detail, but a blow by blow, a blow, by blow would be great. Yeah, yeah. no, brilliant. And how did, um, uh, Ruby um, Panta asks, how did the factor have the ownership of the islands? Um, the factor didn't own the island, um, but he worked for the guy who did. The factor was basically the, the man working for the estate who was responsible for the careful administration of the islands, making sure that he's getting the right profit, um, really should be responsible as well for the islanders' um, health and happiness, or well, to a point, <laughs> at least in terms of Victorian standards. Um, so, but the landlords came to the islands, um, came to own the islands, well, we don't, we don't know. I mean, that's, that's kind of before recorded history really sort of picks up. Um, they were always owned by the MacLeods of MacLeod. So that's the chiefs of Clan MacLeod, um, their seat at Dunvegan Castle. Um, until it was sold to a, a, a cadet branch of the MacLeods, MacLeods of Pabe, um, in the, uh, oh, I think it's 1781. Need to double check that. Um, so, and then it, for about uh, 100 years or so, well, 1781, until I think we're bought back again in 1880s-ish. Um, so for, for nearly 100 years, they were owned by this cadet branch, which is quite interesting as well, because all of these um, landlords, they were all imperialists they were making their money in in, in asia um and whether it's with the, the british east india company or um or just through for trade and commerce so that's really interesting that's when you see a lot of money flowing back into the estate and improvements being made um it's uh, I was, uh, um andrew mckillop at glasgow university has just done a lot of is still doing a lot of really really interesting work there okay so. Well, the next question, I think I can answer this one, and um, probably a lot of people on the call today can answer. Are there many descendants, children, grandchildren of the evacuees still with us? And I suspect that there's quite a few oh, yes. online of us today, and I actually know personally, and I'm sure that you know personally, and, and I believe over the years you've had several come onto the island and you've met them and tracked back their family tree for them. Absolutely, including memorably on, was it your work party, Julie, when we had, oh, was it three different descendants? Um, uh, it was brilliant, all in one work party. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, absolutely. Uh, we, and we do get visitors and, and um, you know, although I'm no longer be working on the islands, uh, it was always my ambition if, I, if, I, if somebody would let me know, you know, I'd really make a lot of effort to spend time with them. We would go and try and find, you know, make sure we found the croft, their family croft. I would look at the, 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 the genealogy maps that we have on island. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure whenever the islands become staffed again by the NTS, uh, they shall be able to continue such treatments. So we've just had a note that um, we've got Finley McQueen's great great granddaughter online with us today as well. Oh, so amazing. Elaine, so that's lovely. Um, so uh, Marie's asked, did Spanish flu affect them after World War I? Uh, I've never seen a evidence of that or a record of indicating that. Um, they did have issues with influenza usually at the start of every summer season and the first boat that would come on island um, kind of in the same way that I mean, I get it. If I if I travel back home to Virginia, which is where I grew up, uh, I tend to get sick pretty quick because it's just a whole different 
you know, it's just strain of diseases there. Um, not saying anything about the cleanliness of Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> no comment there, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> so that's fine. And um, the picture, we believe, is Finley McQueen and his daughter. So Thank you. Finley McQueen. I knew I had McQueen in my head, but yeah, thank you for that. No, that's fine. And um, Maureen has asked, when did the NTS or National Trust for Scotland take over the island? Um, it was bequeathed by Lord Butte in 19... 56 and I think basically all the, the time all the legal transactions everything had been completed it was 1957 really so yeah. full ownership from that point um, and that would be the same year that Operation Hard Rock took place so when the MOD uh, I believe it was the Airmen the Air Corps actually went out to St Kilda again in April 1957 and uh, established a, a base which is still there to this day so Again, St Kilda, weirdly, I think people still imagine it as an uninhabited island. And it technically is. No one person spends more than, you know, six, seven months a year, if, hopefully, um, in, in good cases, when they're not stuck by storms. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't have a postcode, isn't technically inhabited, but there are always people there and have been continuously, almost, apart from a handful of exceptions, really bad weather since 1957. Yeah, right, I've got one final question for you, and this is from Jim Lewis. And um, was there a fueling point on the island during World War II? Oh, that's a good one. So this is one of the great mysteries that we have. Um, I've definitely read reference to it. In fact, the same Alexander Gillies Ferguson, A.G. Ferguson, um, in his yacht, this is the uh, the merchant in Glasgow, the St. Kilton who set up a business in Glasgow, he would he sailed out after the war and he records um, that there was a Nazi flag he found sort of flying over the over the village from the flagpole in front of the manse and which he of course promptly took down and he had hidden a stash of fuel under the pulpit in the church but that was for himself and his own uses and he said that that was still there so he was very pleased that he hadn't in a, inevitably sort of inadvertently aided the enemy um, but no, apart from that, uh, I know there was there's a shady reference or two that I've come across about a couple of guys from the Admiralty being stationed out there early on in the war. And I think probably just to, well, to, you know, maybe keep the um, U-boat crews off the island, but you know, it wouldn't have done very much. And I don't think it lasted very long, to be honest. So, yeah, it's it's all very unclear, but I think really interesting. No, that's lovely. Okay, I think that's everything then, Craig. So thank you so much for, for joining us today and for your talk. It was really, really interesting. I hope you're going to stay on for the rest of the talks. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. Well, I'll catch up with you soon. And I, hopefully I can then do a share screen and if you, hopefully we'll get, well, you lose your screen. Oh, we've done it. That's perfect. Okay, then thanks everybody. Well, thank you to Craig for that talk. It was very interesting. So next on today's agenda, we have, um, I went to see John Gillies in Ipswich and had a lovely afternoon with him and his wife. Um, so next up is um, um, that interview. So um, John's father, Norman John, was five years old when he was evacuated from St Kilda in 1930. And John was um, good enough to share some stories at that time with us. So if you bear with me technically, hopefully this will work. So I guess the first question really is, um, so what was your dad's memories of the evacuation? So he was five years old at the time. Yes, so what, right. what, what, does, what stories did he tell about what it was like? Well, he often spoke about his memories of St Kilda and the fact that he remembered his mother calling him, you know, home for lunch and dinner and tea. And, um, but he didn't say that much about the actual evacuation day. He remembers running about on, on, on board and uh, I think while everyone else was filled with a bit of sadness and a bit of uh, fear for the future, you know, he was just playing hide and seek and um, playing with the other children and it was all an adventure. Um, and I think, I mean, this may be a lot to do with what he's read or heard since, but he often talked about when they landed at... Um, Rock Island Pier and that seeing a car for the first time for instance and a bicycle and um, yeah and he remembers all the hubbub all the reporters about and um, yeah and I think the St Kilden's trying hard to get away from it all really. <laughs> yeah I was gonna say it must have been quite a 
overwhelming really I would have thought from the point of view that you know you've gone from an island where you saw a few tourists yes you'd, you were, you'd used to seeing people and obviously they had lots of like Victorian in Victorian times they were used from that time they're used to people visiting them but like seeing a car yeah must have been quite strange so oh it was and I, th I he often says that um, he thinks the locals and others who came to see them at land uh, were expecting like aliens or something <laughs> or it's like a tourist attraction it, yeah, it? yeah yeah that's right and uh, thought they were weird creatures from this other land i know as you say tourism had opened up and a lot of people had been to st kilda and um but yes it held a lot of fascination for a lot of people and as you know there was a lot in the press at the time and i've still got some of the um, 1930 papers in my collection actually yeah I'll have a look at those later yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, that's good so what happened to him obviously after the evacuation they landed and uh, where did he go next where was the house where was home gonna well, be home for dad and his father and his grandmother because his mother had died in May 1930 in Stop Hill Hospital because she had the story goes that she'd got appendicitis and after two weeks, a fishery vessel called the Norna had, had, had braved the waters and picked her up. And uh, she was taken to Stob Hill Hospital and was there for several months. Um, but unfortunately, she and she was pregnant as well. And she had the baby and the baby they named Annie. Um, and was only, I think, 13 days old when both she and the mother died. Um, but yes, so he hadn't got his mother with him, uh, and he was, he often said he was brought up by his, his father and his, especially his grandmother, um, who substituted f for Mary, his mother. But they were taken to a little place by the sound of Mull called Ardness, um, a little white cottage, which I have actually visited several years ago. Um, but as I was reading, even fairly recently, um, Dad's father, John, he wrote a, a bit of an unkind letter to uh, the Under Secretary of State, Tom Johnson, saying these conditions are, are worse than what it was actually on St Kilda. So he, he wasn't too happy, you know, and uh, eventually he got moved to Larrick Beg in 1931, yeah. which is actually... What my bungalow, house, yeah. yeah, what my bungalow is called, <laughs> and of course my father's house was called St Kilda. So, what did um, what did your your grandfather's job entail of on the mainland? Where, where, where did they put him to work, or did he get did he have a job? Yeah, I think most of the St Kildans were given jobs by the Forestry Commission, and um, which involved not just work with trees but repairing roads and in the sawmill and um, anything connected with trees and, and, and the locality and making fences and uh, so it's quite a varied job but which um, is quite ironic them working with trees as there were none on St Kilda. <laughs> So a tree must have been an interesting sight for your dad as well when he first arrived. Yeah, it was, yes. I mean, obviously a lot of the St Kildans had, had been to the mainland at one time or another, but, um, yeah, um, for, for the youngsters, they would have never seen a tree before. But um, apparently, um, so I've read, that um, uh, in that area, a, a lot of the trees were ver up very high and... Uh, the people, a lot of the people who worked for the Forestry Commission were, were too scared to go up to those heights, but the St Gildans being used to mountain climbing and catching birds off the edge of cliffs, for instance, um, it was second nature, so uh, they planted the trees in those parts the others couldn't reach. <laughs> So they, they were invaluable, really, then, yeah. in that respect. Uh, oh, they so, were. Yeah, so. And, of course, if you go to... Um, more than these days, you'll see some of the trees probably that the St Kildans possibly planted. Yeah, oh, fantastic. So had your dad got any memories from his time on St Kilda? He remembers being called in for has it. Is there any other stories from that time at all when he before he went or before he was evacuated? Yes, he, he had several t stories that he he talked about. Um, obviously. Um, they were very much church-going people, and he, he, he remembers um, 
his mother putting him down in the aisle in the church, or the kirk as they used to call it, and um, him uh, being retrieved by his mother if he crawled too far <laughs> away and being brought back, uh, which is incredible for a child of, I don't know, two or three to, re to remember things like that. And he had one occasion where he was larking about with some friends and um, he got some hot coal ash uh, thrown over him, just as children do, they play jokes and that. And um, yes, and he, he remembers that being obviously very painful. And he, he remembers sitting in, in the cottage on his grandmother's lap and, um, and people coming you know, to visit him, and I think the whole island visited him during that time. And he remembers the nurse tending to his his wounds, as it were, and uh, her teaching him uh, a hymn. And she he often uh, talks about that as well, the first hymn that he ever learnt. Other times that he talks about are, yeah, just playing as normal children do. Did he go up when they obviously were catching the birds? Did he ever go up? Be, was he a bit young to be involved with that? He, or did he play? A, would, he, would he have gone up to see them on the edge of the cliff? Or um, yeah, I suppose he would go up a certain height, but um, obviously to go unattended unattended wouldn't be uh, very very wise. But um, he, I, I, one of the things he did say was he remembers being brought by his granny from Glen Bay and. Um, being carried back to his home. Does he remember his mum at all? Or is it oh, yeah, well, the, the most poignant memory he ever had was, uh, yes, of his, his, his mother um, being taken away uh, on the um, fishery cruiser Norna. And he, he remembers standing on the dike and l looking to see and to wave to his mother I suppose he must have gone down to the pier, yeah. And um, and as is in Beth's Waters' book, there's a picture of him standing there waving to his mother. And that was the last time he ever saw her alive. And um, yes, yeah, so that was very sad for him. And of course his father being away at the same time for a lot of the time was um, was hard for him too. But he had his grandmother Annie, so um, they looked after him. She was his strong female role model in his life. Uh, yes, so, she was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when he got to mainland, or some, he, he obviously started school. Did he, did he go to school on the island, or would he um, put him a bit young? I guess so. He yeah. Would have started school. What, yeah. was, what was that like? He was too him? young to go to school on St Kilda, yeah. because obviously there they spoke the Gaelic, but um, when he came to the mainland. Um, he went to Claggan School and um, he, he often says that he had a teacher called Miss Robertson who um, was a lovely lady, he often says, and uh, he, he often says that sh she would ask him a question in English and, and he would reply in the Gaelic. <laughs> uh, because I don't suppose so many people spoke Gaelic on the mainland as did actually on St Kilda. But yes, um, he... He forgot quite a bit of the Gaelic um, eventually, you know, when he came to settle in Suffolk, but um, he would still know certain phrases and, yeah. you know. So, uh, yes, and I, I remember his uncle Neil, who used to come and visit us very frequently in the summer months, and uh, you would often hear him in his bedroom saying some strange words, and that was his Gaelic prayers that you would oh, okay. often yeah, hear him say. And it sounds, yeah, it's a lovely language, yeah. Mm. But to a young boy like myself, it, you know, it sounds like quite strange. <laughs> it's a strange man in the bedroom. I don't know what he's saying. So. Yeah. <laughs> does he wish that he'd stayed on St Kilda? Or does he regret the decision? Obviously, he was too young to make that decision yeah. at five years old. But do you think that he regretted leaving the island? I don't think so. I mean, as you say, a child is just goes along with what's ever happening, whatever's happening. But um, now he often says that was probably the best thing that ever happened, that um, St Kilda was evacuated. It gave people a chance to earn their own living and um, see the wider world as he did. And um, 
No, he thought it was for the good. I think there was a, a few of the older St Kildans who thought that perhaps it wasn't such a good idea, and you could understand that, you know, having been there all their lives. But all the young men were leaving the mainland and um, finding opportunities to work there and finding it probably a lot easier. Yeah, no, definitely. I think oh, there's a romantic um, vision that yes. St Kilda is this romantic place to be, but actually the reality of that, certainly back in like the 1920s, would have been a completely different story. So yes, it's all good, well and good us going out there go, wouldn't it be lovely, we could stay, you know, there's no internet, there's, you know, no distractions in the world, but... I suspect on a cold winter night with the with the wind blowing and yeah. you know and when the wind blows on St Kilda it, it certainly blows. Oh yeah, it would be a completely different experience. So and yeah. we'd have the modern comforts of electricity and microwaves and things like that, whereas none of that would have been an option back in 1920s. No, certainly it was very hard life. As you say, Dad wasn't old enough to be let down over the cliffs to collect the birds, but. Um, yeah, it was a very risky life, but um, it was obviously very w rewarding at times, and uh, and it must have been very lovely to have um, worked there in the summer months. But mm. obviously, as you say, come the winter, the wind blowing, and uh, yes, it was a it was a very hard life, and uh, they worked long hours, but they survived. Yeah. They did survive, so sometimes with a bit of help from the mail boats. <laughs> yes, that's true, yeah. yes, but it's not quite like the internet, which is you get an instant <laughs> reply, is it? <laughs> you no, know, it might be a week or two. Can you send me a mate. helicopter with a couple of, like, I need some coffee? So. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure the helicopters never abused like that. <laughs> no, no, that's right. But yeah. Yes, if they had these modern-day conveniences, then uh, life would have been that much easier. Yeah. But, of course... You know, I was thinking that, uh, you know, with this pandemic that we've had, it's made me realise what um, life on St Kilda must have been like having people bring disease to the island. And, and if they did, like in 1926, they, a lot of people caught influenza and most of them were, were laid low. And I think about four of them died. And it just makes you realize how hard life was and um you know they had boating accidents and people who who died falling off the cliffs but um yeah that was one of the risks you took it was just a way of life and obviously the um the the, the death rate in um in babies as well was very very high back yes. then as well so you would probably you know even, i can't remember what the numbers are exactly but you could have like give birth to nine, nine children and only actually see two of them yeah. grow, well, to a, grow to a certain age. Yeah, well, his grandfather on his mother's side, Donald McQueen, um, his first wife uh, died, second wife died, and had three wives um, altogether. He had 18 children, but only nine of them actually survived into Which probably adulthood. is a 50% rate. It's actually probably yeah. quite good compared yeah. to some other stories. So yes, that's right. Yeah, imagine now, you know, that would, nowadays, we'd be horrified by those figures. Yeah, oh, definitely. Knowing that half your children would die, it's just, it's just even bare thinking about it. So. No. But that was a way of life on St Kilda. And they had some unusual methods of, didn't they, of, <laughs> yes. of, 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 of smearing the umbilical cord, didn't they, with, with fulmer oil, fulmer oil, oil yeah, and, and so, uh, yeah, yeah and and things like that, which wasn't very probably hygienic. Yeah, uh, so... But I guess it's habits as well, isn't it? It's the way of yeah. life. So, and, and obviously, even before the church came to the island, they had their own belief system, and those. But it's just island ways, isn't it? Yeah. Grow up with it. Just goes from generation to generation. Oh yeah, definitely. Yes. Thank you so much, John, for joining us today, and thank you for sharing stories of um, of your of your dad. And um, I look forward to hearing more and speaking again in the future. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Okay, so thank you everybody. Oh, thank you, John, for that. Thank you very much for having us in your garden and I hope you all enjoyed that talk. And um, also thank you to Simon Manfield for his fabulous photos, oh, sorry, for images that we used um, throughout the presentation there. So thank you very much. Next up on the agenda, um, Bill Cameron very, very kindly interviewed Ian Formber for us and he's gonna to talk to us a bit about 
um, his time after the St Kilda's had evacuated, what it was like after they'd come off the island and life for them and his, and his views on that as well. So we're going to give this a go and I will um, share my screen again. So one second. So we're sitting here uh, just along the coast from Wachalan. Uh My name is Bill Cameron and I'm sitting here with Ian Former. And the interview hopefully will give us some insight uh, to what Ian uh, can tell us of his experiences of growing up in a community where St Kildans uh, once lived. Um, Ian, what was your earliest memory of St Kildans? Well, I suppose it started in the early 1960s, so that's um, 30 years after the St Kildans came here. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time initially with Donald Gillis, who at that time had just retired from the Forestry Commission and was living in Larrick Beg and helping the uh, Tornish estate with some of the farming activities. Not heavy work, but particularly making hay. And the one thing that interested me working alongside Donald <clears throat> was how good he was at forecasting the weather. I remember one day, it was a lovely summer's day, not a cloud in the sky, and he had a curlew calling. Oh, he said, listen, listen, she's calling for rain. Well, I said, what do you mean, Donald? Well, you wait, it'll be raining by this afternoon. So I said, come on, Donald, not a cloud in the sky, beautiful summer's day. Do you really mean to tell me you can say that there's rain coming? You wait and see. So, <clears throat> by three o'clock, along came a shower and it started to rain. But I thought there was something very deep there I suppose if you're living so close to nature with no interruptions, then pick up on these sort of things. It's a sense, one of the senses which has been lost. Yeah. I think you're right, Ian, in uh, living so close to the land of everyday activities were uh, connected to the land and particularly being so exposed to the elements, they would see weather and signs of, of uh, different conditions coming in uh, across the Atlantic. Did the St Kildans have an, uh, a U.S. accent or did they, was it just a, a typical West Highland accent? Would you there distinguish was, it as? Yeah, there was something about it. I, I'm not quite sure. It, obviously, Gaelic was at its roots. But to go back to Donald recognising the signs of weather, forecasting the weather, it's because they had plenty of time to, to absorb that. There was no great rushing around, or as they say in the islands, don't be putting hurry on yourself, there's no need. The one day, I suppose, ran into another, and um, Donald in particular, and, and also the, 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 the younger St Kildans, they um, they were at peace with themselves. There was no uh, looking at their watch or anything. Um, they were, they were really lovely people, and uh, I was encouraged to carry on them sometimes twice a week. And um, we go to the house, and it would not there wasn't just one tea. There were two teas in the evening, and. As we sat at the table, they were preceded by a garlic grace. Not a long one, but a garlic grace, which I thought was very nice. And they were very, very hospitable um, and kind people. And it was a, a natural uh, kindness. There was nothing put on. And, um, and, and they enjoyed company. And I think that is particularly what they missed when they came to Morven. They were promised that they would get crofts and the crofts would be uh, beside each other and, and they would be together but they weren't, they were horrified when they arrived at Loch Allen and various vehicles took them off to their new accommodation but they were going all, all going in different directions 
So that that was a great sadness. He never got over that. And culturally, I, mean, I think anyone that's read anything about St Kilda thinks of the effect or the way in which religion was integrated into their life. What would you say all of the St Kildans remained religious going to Keel Church? Uh, they they went to not Keel Church, which is Church of Scotland, uh -huh. but the United Free Church right. in Loch Allen. Okay. And they would walk there, be a distance of two miles, and um, they, they, they were walking in single file. But during the week, if they had to go to the village, their women would be knitting as they walked, which the locals found quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. So they 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 they, they, they kept the, the the Sabbath day holy. They, they they didn't work on the Sunday. No, no. But it, it wasn't. They weren't forcing that on no. anybody, and it, 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 you weren't discouraged from visiting on no, Sunday. There wasn't a sort of pious. Oh, I don't uh, know. No, no, I, I never saw that. No, no. Never saw it. No. Uh, but I think it obviously was very much ingrained in their their outlook on where they had come to. That um, it, you know, it was ordained, and that was the thought, and they make the most of it. But. So the problem was the press gave them quite a hard time when they first arrived. There were two or three hundred local people on the Loch Allen Pier the night they landed. <clears throat> and a friend of mine summed it up. He went down to see what was going on and he took a friend with him and watched for about ten minutes and the friend said, Ah, oh, come on our way home, they're just like ourselves. The press had hyped yes. that to them yes. being something different, and they weren't different That's at right. all. And it must have been a great shock at being um, told to go ashore there. And I think there were 17 pressmen and photographers. Yes. That would daunt anybody. Quite alarming. Yeah, yeah. being a spectacle. T tell me, I've seen uh, pictures of Lachie MacDonald's uh, mother and sister. Um, when they stayed down, uh, they went to Larrach Peg, they were down at Savary, Savary. is that right? Mm -hmm. um, pictures that I've seen of, of Lachie's mother, she continued to spin and uh, his sister, the image that I've seen, uh, his sister was carding mm -hmm. uh, the wool. Did, did they, you've just said they knitted when they were you know, going uh, about their daily activities. Did the, did the men ever continue their weaving? Did, was there any no, of that or was it just knitting? They weren't encouraged to take looms with them. Um, and it was put to them, oh, you'll be so busy working and um, earning a wage. There was no time for, for um, working at the looms. But that was a mistake. And uh, so many of the looms were either stolen or destroyed when some of them went back, so they would go back on holiday during the summer. Yeah. But um, they, 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 as far as I know, I've never heard that they started weaving again. And I think the other thing that they missed, and it's something that a lot of historians and a lot of writers have not picked up on, they weren't allowed to take the dogs with them. And the dogs were drowned in the bay before they left. Now, when People live in an isolated place. The animals are very much part of their life, particularly the dogs. They're very fond of the dogs. And I think that was a dreadful thing to, yeah. to, to, to say you're not taking your dogs with you. Yeah. They would have obviously used the dogs when they were um, not just as, as, as family pets in the modern day sense, but they would have been possibly working dogs when they had the sheep. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. On, on, on her but yeah. that was no reason for them not no, to. No. And I think also um, they should have been encouraged to have some stock sheep. But then again, they were so scattered. Had they been together in one place, in one place, yeah. it would have been much easier for them. Then the uh, Beg, the main place they came to, was it's a row of cottages, a reinforced concrete built in 1873, and there are five apartments in each. Um, but there was no, there were gar there was gardens at the back, but there was no, a, 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 no land suitable for stock. John Gillis had uh, had a cow when he was at Ardness, <clears throat> but um, he, he didn't keep it for very long. And and when they came to, how many how many St Kildans 
came to Ohio and they knew they didn't all come. How many? Uh, the 36. The, <clears throat> yeah, 36 men, women and children cleared off the island. I'm not using the word evacuation because uh, something's wrong there. They were cleared, yeah. let's face it. And 28 of them arrived in the Ohio and Pier. Mm -hmm. And um, they came ashore very quiet and then when they'd set foot on, on the pier on Morven, the those that were gathered clapped and gave them a small cheer, but they didn't they didn't really respond to that. They smiled as they yes. passed by. <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm assuming from what I've read that a lot of the men of, of working age were employed in, in forestry, is that right? Yes, they had that opportunity when uh, Tom Johnson, the Under Secretary of State for Scotland, went out. That he said, now you can either work in the roads department within the forestry, or you can work planting trees and cutting trees down. And a lot of them, I don't know why, they chose the, the forestry work. And there was quite a lot of work in the nursery uh, in raising the trees. But um, they were employed in making drains and uh, um, thinning trees and planting them in one particular place is called any more it's quite steep it's a basalt slope and um, it's, uh, it's constantly moving and it's said to be one of the finest examples of soil erosion in Scotland so their job was to go up the steep slope plant the trees to arrest this uh, movement but it didn't really work and the trees never came on. You can still see remnants of what they planted there. Uh -huh. um, so the, the generally the men went to work in their bare feet and uh, they would have their boots tied around their neck and obviously if they were using spades or other in implements then they put them to boots on. But that, the one thing I'd like to have seen and it, it's quite vivid in my mind is the uh, they used to be divided up into certain gangs across the hillside and maybe mile, two miles apart. But when they stopped for their lunch or a cup of tea, they were communicating with each other using semaphore. They'd been taught how to use, to, to right. use semaphore stars. because of the naval yes. presence on the island. Okay. Yep. So I thought that was quite interesting. And I doubt there were very few of their, their local colleagues could, uh, could understand <laughs> what they were saying. And obviously bird fowling had been an integral part of their life. Um, and then they left that. There was nothing there was nothing in the area that would have you know, that, that was their main source of well, not income but food. There was no there was no fowling took place. There was there's no there's no puffins or anything like that in the Morven oh, no, Peninsula. None at all. No, none at all. No. They, they had to turn their back on all that. Well, did they fish at all? Did they or was it just a would that have been as a leisure pursuit? Yeah, well I think no? I think possibly John Gillis, when he was living at Ardness, he had a boat. Mm -hmm. But um it's not a particularly good beach or a bay there and I think it got damaged in the storm. But he was obviously going out and catching a few mackerel. But I don't think there were St Gildens as a whole were doing very much fishing when they were on the island. No, no. <clears throat> and in terms of uh, the, the community, the, uh, the St Gildens that came off, did they gather together at times? Or, or what, you know, they were at Larachbeg, they were at Savary. Um, did, did they come together as a, or did they just sort of I think just they, integrate into yes, local life? Well, I, yeah, I think there was a sort of a lot of amusement, but but going back to Donald Gillis, he became an agent for an insurance company. Right. So he'd go round all the houses in the area, uh, collecting the weekly insurance. Right. Okay. And his mental arithmetic was fascinating, and and really very good. Uh -huh. But they went, the younger ones went to school at Clagham. And there's still a lady living in Loch Allen, two ladies living in Loch Allen, who uh, remember being in school with them. Goodness. And I said, you know, what was their education? I go, it was every bit as good as ours and probably better. Mm -hmm. And they were well dressed and um, took an interest in everything that was going on. Uh -huh. Obviously the first the, the, the first uh, tongue would be in the Gaelic. Oh yes, yes. Um, yeah. Would that be their their everyday language, if they were on the, on the hill or amongst people, I mean, was was more of an a Gaelic-speaking community right. at that time. It was 
there was far more, there were far more Gaelic speaking people then than there are today. Right. And um, yes, I think there was quite a lot of dialogue going on in, in Gaelic. And um, so that created a bond as well. Yeah. There's obviously so much written about St Kilda and, you know, having spoken to Lachy McDonald's widow Nancy over a number of years, um, I got the feeling that Lachy was quite happy in retrospect to have come off the island and and wasn't as nostalgic as many people are about uh, St Kilda today. Do you think the St Kildans regretted? You, do you did, did you get a feeling of the St Kildans not wanting to be in Loch Allen or did, was they, were they did they show any feelings towards wanting to go back? Oh yes, I think deep down they didn't want to go back, but they didn't want to make a fuss about it. Uh, there were obviously certain things that they missed, and also their family were buried over there. Yes. This great desire to come back. It's connected to the land. And, and, and yes, and Donald, uh, when Donald Gillis and his wife died, they were buried in Keel, just above Loch Allen, and uh, theirs is the only stone uh, that says St Kilda on it. Yeah, yeah. And obviously a lot of the St Kildans had families here and, and they moved to other parts of Scotland and, and in some cases other parts of the world. Do you still hear from them or do people still come back or is there, are there any connections still in Loch Allen with St Kildans? No, not no, they're, now. They're all... that, so there's a gravestone yep. and there's a house formerly called McKechnie's Buildings, uh -huh. but Donald Gillis and his wife went into it and thereafter it was called St Kilda. Right. So the, the name's there, but ah, okay. there's no other connection. Um, and I suppose I knew about half a dozen of them, uh -huh. but over the years they've gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think they added to Loch Island in terms of um, their contribution? Or were they special in any way? Did they did they stand out as, yes, as people? They, they, yes, they stood out. As I said earlier, the, the press gave them a hard time and they were constantly visiting them. Right. And uh, they set up a story of one reporter going to uh, Donald's house and um, the old lady there, they were talking to her about how did she like living in a house with hot and cold running water compared to where she had come from. And she said, oh, it's, just, it's wonderful. They've, they've even given, given me a dishwasher. It's a dishwasher. Could you show it to me? So she took them through to the lavatory and she said, we'll just put the, the plates in there and pull the chain. Oh, that awful story. And, uh, so they were very, very reluctant. When strangers came to the door, they were reluctant to speak to them. But latterly, Donald Gillis, um, he would give them a good story, but they had to pay for it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um. Obviously, the, the interest in St Kilda seems to know no bounds. Every year, a new book or title or something comes out um, looking at a new aspect of St Kilda. And this year being the 90th year since the uh, clearing, as you call it, of St Kilda, um, wh what do you think yourself, uh, as a West Highlander, Ian, what do you think the appeal of St Kilda is? What do you think makes people interested in this set of islands 40 miles out from US. Well, I think it's, you can hardly believe that people lived out there. But this is the trouble nowadays, the whole thing's changed. If people see a cat fight, they need counselling. Yes. So, you know, it's all very well to be critical about the conditions they were living in, but they're perfectly happy, uh, intelligent, there's no fighting, I don't think there was any pressure. Mm -hmm. Uh, not, not, nothing but modern way of life and having to rush around the whole time. There's, there's an obvious um, sense of almost seeing the St Kildans as a, as a utopian society, but obviously they had their struggles and, and we know latterly that, you know, the, uh, one of the St Kildan ladies, uh, I think it was uh, Mrs Gillis, um, was taken to Glasgow and sadly didn't return and, mm. and that was one of the last sort of signals and is there anything you could say about the clearing of St Kilda from from a perspective of someone that grew up listening to stories of the St Kildans in, in, in Loch Allen? Do you think it was right that it, that it was cleared or do you think they could have survived 
that a bit longer. I think they certainly could have survived, but, but of course, if you say that, people say, well, it's all right for you sitting here saying that In now. Hindsight. You weren't there at the time putting up with yeah, it. Yeah. But they were, they, as far as I could see, they were perfectly capable of looking after themselves and they adjusted their life accordingly. Yes. They, there were people putting ideas in their head um, several years before the clearance came. Uh, Nurse Barclay for one. Yeah. And um, of course the whole thing was politically driven. It was the Labour Party who wanted them off the island because they were getting in constant trouble from the Conservative Party who were saying you're leaving these poor people on the island, you're doing nothing about it. You haven't even given them a radio for the, so that they could contact the mainland if someone required uh, medical assistance. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely appalling. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a photograph, it's an old postcard of the um, SS uh, Hebrides sitting in the bay, offloading provisions, and you can see an elderly lady struggling up the rocks with a bag of, I suppose it was either flour or oatmeal. Twen 30 years later, there's another photograph showing an aeroplane dropping food. Mm -hmm. Now that's if they yeah. had been able to hang on, yeah. and the, but the government could have done so much, but they, they did nothing, and neither did Sir Reginald McLeod and McLeod. Not yeah. interested. Mm. And he, that man has a lot to answer for, because yeah. he, not only was he a landowner, landlord, but he was the clan chief. Yes. And he should have known better, and he was a man uh, living and working in high society could have done so much for them but did nothing. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, you've made some, uh, made some um, really good points here, Ian. Do you think that the fact that the, the community itself were, were ageing and a lot of the young men had decided one, once the, there was this military presence on, on St Kilda that they had seen there was possibly an easier way of life, that was the beginning of the end of, of, of the St Kilda community well somebody could have who could have come up with some some form of employment or something for them to do if yeah. they had taken an interest and that's where McLeod should have come yeah. in there but he yeah. didn't yeah. Yeah. I've heard great stories from Nancy that the St Kilda's were great singers mm -hmm. um, well, did you ever hear them sing well, obviously uh, Sam singing would, would have been uh, what they were used to in the church in Village Bay did you ever hear the St Kilda's sing were no, I, th I, I think the, the traditional songs got knocked on the, no, head, knocked on the head for, for religious reasons. Yeah. But, but the Free Church of Scotland, which they would have been adhering to, that would have been the, the religion on the island in pre-1930. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. In, so in terms of other musical instruments, they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't fiddlers, they wouldn't pipers. No, I never heard. Yeah, I, I think that I think there was a, a Jew, Jew's harp, Jew's right. harp there. Right. Yeah. 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 But uh, I've never heard, of, heard them talk about anything else. Uh -huh. But they, they, they were, they seemed satisfi satisfied with a lot, but they had listened very carefully to what Tom Johnson had said to them. And um, so they weren't slow in asking for the rights. For example, um, they, 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 they got their milk from the, they had to buy milk from our Tornish estate. Now, they, I can't remember what the, the charge was, but the charge went up. And Donald Gillis, who was a spokesman for quite a few, he wrote a letter to Owen Hugh Smith, who owned the estate, just saying, we're not really grumbling, but we want you to know that the price of milk has, has gone up, and that's not what we were promised to begin with. So he was just letting him know. And I don't know if anything was done. Right. Right, so they weren't, they, weren't, they weren't that shy. Oh no, they weren't, they they weren't, weren't shy. Uh, they weren't shy. Coming yeah. forward. But I think, I think they were fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, there doesn't seem to be, as I say, a, 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 an end to uh, the interest in St Kilda. And um, I think two or three years ago, maybe even longer, the last St Kilda passed St Kildan passed away in, in uh, Glasgow. Now I think her descendant was buried in in Keel Cemetery. Am I right in saying that? Yes, I think. 
Yes. We're, is it Rachel Johnson? I think it'd Rachel? be Rachel Johnson. Johnson. I'm not 100% not sure. Right. There's certainly not a stone for her. Anyway. Right, yeah. right. No. But the, uh, I've obviously looked at a lot of the uh, St Kilda history and read quite a number of books. But the, the one reporter, the, the one newspaper who covered the uh, clearance and actually was writing about St Kilda long before right back in the 1870s and 1880s was the Auburn Times. Mm -hmm. The editor of the Auburn Times, um, Flora Macaulay, who was a Cameron, and <clears throat> the Cameron family were very interested in Gaelic, local tradition, yes. piping, and uh, shinty. So they covered the goings-on of, of St Kilda really very well, and in the last month or so I've been going through the Open Times for 1930, taking that as a benchmark, and uh, there's some fascinating stuff there. Uh -huh. The Camerons would use the official, for want of another word, uh, press releases uh -huh. on St Kilda, but they also encouraged people to write in and uh, give their opinion. So yes. there were letters, and long letters, and there were reports, and they're very, very enlightening. So I am planning on producing another book about it, and certainly that will alter the way of thinking on St Kilda and the evacuation. Yes, because I, I'm sure news, or, or the, the viewpoint of that day would have been much, much different to the way we interpret St Kilda today. It's almost been sanitised and uh, we interpret it in a, in a much different way and I'm sure people looked at the, at the plight of the St Kildans um, much differently back back in 1930. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Tell me, Ian, going back to Loch Allen, and, and obviously this is why we're speaking to you because you're, you're from there, but when the St Kildans came to Loch Allen, were they answerable to anyone or were they just housed by the Artonish estate? Did, you know, were, you know, in previous days on, on Herta, they would have spoken to the, the factor who was the, the uh, MacLeod's man on the, on the island. Um, but were they answerable to anyone on, on, in Morven? Well... Was there a factor? Yeah, but they, they, they were living in Forestry Commission cottages. Okay. The Tornish Estate right. sold two cottages okay. to the Forestry Commission right. for them. Yes. Uh, although they were living uh, in in other uh, in other houses owned by other people. Right. So, in, in a way, they were answerable, but uh -huh. but not in another. There was no, there was there was no sub subservience. No, at all. no, no. Uh -huh. um. I've heard stories of the St Kildans being quite taken aback by uh, obvious things that we take for granted, uh, such as bicycles. Uh, and uh, I believe one of the St Kildans was quite alarmed to see someone coming down the pier at Loch Allen on a bicycle. Is there any truth to that? Is there I, any? I've never heard that no, story. No, no, I don't no. know if they did have bicycles. They seem to like walking. Yes. Uh -huh. It seems it seems slightly ironic that the the a lot of the the, the men folk. Um, were involved in forestry and and yet the, there are no trees on St Kilda. I know, I know. It seems, it seems like, but obviously they put their their cragsman skills to good use, as you say, on 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 the slopes. Yes. Um, yeah. Planting. I'm assuming, you know, we 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 tend to portray the St Kilda as a as a rare breed, but they're, I guess they're just like any other. Well, like the West Highlander man said, "Come on, we're away home. They're just like ourselves." Yes. yes. And that's how I think they, they, they did integrate well, uh -huh. <clears throat> and because of the Gaelic language. Uh, possibly had there been more children, uh, it would have gone deeper. Yes. Uh -huh. the, the work ethic, I mean, obviously we, we, hear, we hear and see pictures, obviously, um, of the St Kilda Parliament and how, uh, oh, it might be a, a little bit made up, but they used to congregate at certain times of the day, the men folk, and decide what they would do. That that obviously that was no longer they they were they had a gaffer I'm sure and they were told which bits to plant. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you think they had an equal society where, where, you know, it seems like a lot of the women were doing a lot of the hard grafting, you know. Well, uh, that, that was uh, that's what happened throughout the the, uh, the West Highlands. Right. So the men would be um, repairing the clothes. Yes. 
and working at the looms and the women were doing quite a lot of mm -hmm. hard physical work outside. I saw exactly the same in, in Central Africa, in Rwanda. Right. They, they obviously had a wide range of skill set, you know, in terms of, you know, the men were essentially weavers and tailors, is that right? Yes. And uh, the women, uh, the, the ladies on, on St Kilda were involved in, well, apart from re re rearing children, but involved in quite a lot of agriculture as well. I know they went over to Glen Bay, uh, you know, for milking the cows and, and, mm. and various activities like that. Um, yes, I think out of necessity they were, they were doing it. Did, did the women, when uh, the ladies that were uh, taken off the island, did, did, did they have jobs when they came to Loch Allen? No, 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 no. Right. No, I suppose you know, if you go from a three-roomed cottage to a five-apartment house, there was probably enough to be done yeah, there. Be done. It would be spotlessly clean. Yes, yes. And then if their husbands were out all day... Then... They would have been preparing things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. But um, there was a lot of leg pulling going on. Uh, for example, the local men told them that, well, you're working for the government now. You don't, you don't need to put any postage stamps on your letters. Just put OHMS on the top on her Majesty on His Majesty's service. So they were doing that, but it wasn't long before that Open Postmaster cottoned on to what was happening. <laughs> but I think they had also had a good sense of humour. Yes, yeah. yes. I, when I spoke to uh, the late Nancy Macdonald um, in Glen Nevis, she said that uh, Lachy had always missed the sea view, and there he was sitting looking out his uh, living room window at uh, the side of Ben Nevis. W was there a sense that they missed the landscape? Or did, did, is there any stories that you could say that, that, that you know, that they, they, they didn't like where they were? Or did they, did they just made the best of what they had? Well, is they made the best of it, yes. yes, yes. And that was the idea of, of getting John um, Gillis to, to go to Lower Ardness because he'd been beside the sea. Of course. But as we discussed earlier, they'd more or less given up going to sea yes. to fish. It was mainly fouling on the, yes. on the sea stars. Well, even that obviously had stopped. Well, yeah. 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 Um, we're in 2020, and obviously 90 years have passed since the, the clearing of St Kilda. Uh, do you think there's still things we can learn about the the Herta way of life, or the, or anything from the St Kildans that can that can give us some greater understanding uh, in 2020? I mean, c can we learn from the St Kildans? Basically, that's what I'm trying to say. From their way of life, yes. are, are we just portraying them as a as a sort of rare species? Well, there's a tendency to do that, but I read um, Mary Cameron's reminiscences. Yes. Uh, recently, and that is one of the best books because it goes straight into the heart of the, the community. And now, this is Mary Cameron. She was the missionary's daughter. Is yes, that right? Yes. Yep. So yeah. her father, who hailed from Balahulish, uh, Donald Cameron, um, I think was only supposed to be out for a year as a missionary, and ended up staying quite a few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. But her, her account was really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, it was the daily lives and how yes. they were thinking. Yes. It's a great shame that. The School of Scottish Studies hadn't been formed before 1930 and that they'd sent someone out there, yes. but of course they didn't realise it was going to be cleared, but put somebody out there for a year to live amongst them. Yes. Uh, we would, but it would have learnt an awful lot more. Yes. Yeah. Um, we tend now to, to um, assume that we know from, from some of the great uh, writers about it, but you know they were looking at it from a, a different perspective altogether. I think many of the books, Ian, as, you, as you're alluding to, um, many books about St Kilda have been written and, and some of the authors have not actually visited the island. Mm -hmm. So there is possibly a, a, uh, that sense. Um, there's a lot to be said for the oral tradition. Oh, yes, uh, yes. And particularly if somebody uh, who understood Gaelic, it would be far better to have got it in Gaelic. Yes, yes, it has, it has a, a deeper uh, meaning and significance, I suppose. Yes. Um, Okay, so uh, I think we'll we'll finish up like that, Ian. Um, uh, thank you for uh, giving us such an insightful uh, interview. My pleasure. Uh, it was a very great um, experience for me, having brushed against the St Kildans for a relatively short period, but 
I found it fascinating and I have a, a very deep admiration for the lovely people. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Ian and Bill. That was fantastic. And it was a really fascinating look at St Kilda, I'm sure you'll all agree. Um, I just wanted to say that all the images that were shared throughout that interview were provided by the, um, or reproduced by the National Trust for Scotland. So thank you, National Trust and Ian Richards. So next up, it's our last speaker. And we have, oh, it's, um, it's, it's going to be Ewan MacDonald from Garfal, Garfal, sorry, I can't pronounce it very well, um, which means the Great Orc. So I'm going to put, put that on for you. Thanks for joining this event and big thanks to the St Kilda Club for inviting me along. I'm Ewan MacDonald uh, and I'm here today to play you some music and talk about the background to Gerfau, which is a music project which marks two anniversaries connected to St Kilda. 180 years since the last great orc or Gerfau in the UK was killed on Staken Armin and obviously 90 years since the evacuation. The idea for the project came from my dad Murdo, who told me about our family connection to St Kilda. My great 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 uncle was Lachlan McKinnon, one of the men who killed the great orc. This is what they looked like, about 75 centimetres long. They couldn't fly, but they were excellent swimmers and able to dive to depths of 75 metres looking for fish. Great auks were once common around St Kilda, which offered them an ideal nesting location. When Martin Martin visited in 1697, he described them as the largest and stateliest of the seabirds he saw there. However, over the next century and a half, their numbers declined so steeply that it faded from the memories of the people of St Kilda. In July 1840, Lachlan McKinnon and four other men were hunting seabirds on the cliffs of Stacken Armin. They happened upon a single great auk sleeping on a cliff and captured it, tying it up and taking it to their bothy. The bird made a tremendous racket, like a gannet but many times louder, and nearly cut through the rope tethering it with its bill. Soon after, a storm blew up. The combination of the sudden bad weather and the eerie noises made by the strange bird frightened the men and caused them to believe it was a witch. On Lachlan's suggestion, three days after capturing it, they beat it to death with two large rocks. It took a full hour to kill it. This was the last known bird in the UK. Four years later, the last in the world was killed by specimen hunters in Iceland. I found the story really inspiring and started to look more into the music of St Kilda as a way to mark the two anniversaries following this year. Being a Gaelic-speaking area, the music of St Kilda stems from the Gaelic song tradition, though it also has its own unique features. Martin Martin noted that though the islanders loved music, the only instrument they had was the jaw harp, which nonetheless disposed them to dance mightily. Later, in 1758, Kenneth Macaulay wrote about how much they enjoyed dancing, even to bad fiddle playing. Alongside the dancing, however, were many sad laments. One such song was described by a 19th century visitor as one of the wildest and eeriest he had ever heard, the burden or refrain being manifestly an imitation, consciously or unconsciously, of the loud discordant clamour of a flock of seafowl over a shoal of fish. The increasing influence of the church over the 19th century, however, acted to suppress the island's musical heritage, though there is still plenty to be found. We adapted the traditional tunes on the album from a combination of early 20th century archive recordings and manuscripts from the 18th and 19th centuries. We wanted to make a contemporary response to the anniversaries, and this informed the musical direction of the project. There's seven of us in the band. I play fiddle, viola, harmonium and do a bit of singing. Mandolin, concertina and banjo are played by Chris Jones. Cello, synth and vocals by Jess Welligan. Bazooki by Stuart Graham. Synth percussion vocals by Richard O'Flynn. And viola de gamba vocals in Arho, that's a traditional Chinese instrument, by uh, Nathan Bontrager. Of course, having read what Martin Martin said about how much the jaw harp was loved on the island, we couldn't do without that. Spiff Vegan plays the jaw harp on the album, all the way from Baltimore. We also had fun imagining what a Gerfile might have sounded like. <coughs> the whole album was arranged and recorded during lockdown, with everyone working remotely via the internet. Instead of meeting in a studio, we recorded it separately from London, Liverpool, Leeds, Cologne and Baltimore in the US. We used our homes or spaces that had been emptied and quietened by the virus. Usually I'd record something on the fiddle and harmonium, and then it would pass around everyone and finally end up with Rich, who would add the final touches, produce it and mix it. 
it was an interesting way to create music and quite new to us. It was strange not being able to bounce ideas off people in the same room, but also quite exciting when each new version of the tracks was sent through and seeing what different directions people took the music in. Anyway, here's a listen to the opening track on the album, Hindala Horari Ho Hindala La. The title is made up of vocable syllables without any concrete meaning, but the verses, which we don't actually sing, uh, are about a woman complaining that the young man she's been flirting with has not brought her any seaver decks to show his bravery and ability. It dates from the late 18th century. The visuals on the video are from the album artwork, The Living Wall Gilmot Cliffs, by US-based artist Callie Yateman.
The story of Lachlan McKinnon and the others killing the Gerfowl out of superstitious fear seems to belong to another age. It's easy to recoil instinctively from the damp and primitive brutality of the killing. Yet today seabirds are dying at a faster rate than ever before, and entirely due to human action. Today, we are killing them not with rocks, but in a way no less brutal for all its fragile veneer of civilization. Carbon fields, economic growth, and the effects of climate change. It seems that we have still not learned the lessons of the extinction of the Great Orb. In 1994, there were over 500 kittiwake nests on St Kilda. By 2017, there was only one, and the single egg in it failed to hatch. Other species are also declining fast. 45% of Europe's seabirds breed in Scotland, and St Kilda's million-strong colonies are the largest on our side of the Atlantic. The conservation work carried out on St Kilda is of vital global importance if other seabirds are not to go the way of the Gerfowl. I'm going to leave you now with a tune written by my father Murdo when he was on St Kilda on a work party in 2010. It's also on the album, in a different version to what you'll hear now, and appropriately for today's anniversary, it's called A Fagel Hirscht, or Leaving Hirte. If you're interested in finding out more about the music, then you can visit our website, gerfowl.co.uk, or our Bandcamp page, gerfowl.bandcamp.com, which is where you can buy the CD. It's called Cliffs, and it's out today. And you can also get limited edition prints of a Gerfowl made by the cover artist, Callie Yateman. Thanks again to the St Kilda Club for having me on, and to everyone here for logging in. Bye.
Okay, so that's all folks, as they say. So I just want to say um, a big thank you for all of you who've joined us today. And thank you for bearing with us with our technical glitches at the start. So hopefully I think we improved as, as the um, event went on. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the programme. Um, there's been loads of positive comments coming through. So thank you all for those. It really does mean a lot to us. Um, before we go, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone who has purchased um, anything through the online shop today. It's, um, it's been really, really busy. There's lots of emails clicking through. So thank you everybody for those. Um, if you haven't been on the online shop, we do have some commemorative items on there. We have a commemorative um, postcard pack and we also have available for pre-order Elizabeth Gifford's new book called The Last Families of St Kilda. So please, if you haven't already popped on, please go and have a look. That'd be fantastic. If you don't want to buy anything from the shop, but you'd like to make a donation to St Kilda, the St Kilda Club, all, um, all donations will go towards the conservation work on the island that's carried out by the National Trust for Scotland. So every penny will go towards a good, a good cause and it'll go towards St Kilda. So again, I think the link should be coming up if it hasn't already come up in the chat. If my able-bodied assistant has managed to do that, hopefully. There it is. Excellent. Thanks, Emma. Um, also, that some other things that are happening regarding the commemorative, um, to de to, uh, the commemorative anniversary of the 90th anniversary is that um, the Island Book Trust is going to be pre-printing um, two St Kilden books for the anniversary, uh, one of which is Cleats to Castles by Callum MacDonald, which is a Marion, our new shop convener's dad's book, and also um, a book called St Kilda um, Snapshots, um, which I don't think is on the website at the moment, but I think will be on very, very shortly. Um, so please, if you're interested in books, then please go and check them out. I just want to say a big thank you to all our speakers today. So to Craig Sanford, John Gillies, Jim Percival, Ian Formber, and Bill Cameron for interviewing Ian, um, and Ewan McDonald and, and Gare Fowl, which I think I pronounced far better this time than I did last time. And also to everyone else who was involved with helping to organise the event. So uh, thank you all so much. And um, in true film style, we should have a credit at the end just to say a final thank you. Oh.